Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. The book of Micah. Micah being one of the few, if not the only, title that is actually a question. Who is like God? The answer, nobody. Nobody. We only have our Father, and thank God, that's it. Nothing, no one can compare to our loving Father and His patience with His children. You'll remember in this book of Micah, the first three chapters are threatenings, and the father puts it, he's very rough, and naturally, as always, he's rougher on preachers than anyone else. That is to say, false teachers that uh, teach falsely, and they do call themselves preachers, and usually, and so would that be it. But he comes to the fourth chapter, and it begins the restoration, but there are still circumstances of threatenings entered in but I would have you, as we're in chapter 5, verse 4, not forget the 13th verse of the last chapter, whereby he said he would take his election and give them iron or um, iron horns. That means their power will be as iron and brass hooves on the threshing floor. Hey, that's tough threshing. When you uh, thresh against that threshing floor with brass hoofs, then you know that our Father means business. And of course, always remember this. The thrashing is to separate the wheat from the chaff, and the chaff will be burned, yes. But we're going to work with it for a thousand years first uh, in certain circumstances. So with that having been said, he comes to chapter 5, and he wants to put together an army, an army that is willing to stand with him, for him, and not pay any attention to anything that the enemy can put out, because we can put out more. And he says in verse 2 that from uh, Bethlehem uh, uh, that uh, Christ would be born. It has to do with our captain, our shepherd, our chief shepherd, he that leads us, he that gives us strength, he that gives us victory over anything that would come against us. And how would you like to join that army? That's what he's asking here. So as we pick it up in chapter 5, verse 4, a word of wisdom from our Father, let's go with it. And it reads, And he, and that he is Christ, of course, shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall abide, for now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. That is to say, time everlasting. And from the time he would be born at Bethlehem in less than 33 years, or approximately 33 years, he would even change the times from B.C. to A.D., okay? So never before, though many might like to um, say, well, do you think he really existed? Well, look at your calendar, all right? And tell me what A.D. means. And then have the nerve to ask, was he real? Anadomini, the year of our Lord, A.D., okay? Verse 5. And this man shall be the peace. I want you to note that man is added. It's in italics, okay? And this shall be the peace when the Assyrian, and this is one of the names of the Antichrist, okay, and here sim and for your generation, the Antichrist, shall come into our land. And when he shall tread in our palaces, that's to say he's going to try to take the high seat and will, then shall we raise against him seven shepherds. I repeat, seven shepherds and eight principal men. Always remembering, uh, for your learning, God refers to in the masculine to Messiah in, in verse 4, whereby here you know the 7,000 plus Christ makes and gives the victory. We don't have to sweat it. 
So don't ever let them see you sweat. We got it made, all right? So, and naturally, seven being spiritual completeness, then naturally eight is new beginnings, and he is the one. That's why he could say, uh, to, uh, great unto the ends of the earth, for there is no end to this earth. As we move into the third earth age, it goes into the eternity. Verse six, and they shall waste let, let's take this word waste and think on it a moment. It means to feed, if you would, or to eat up. Uh, to, but um, with, uh, it means the rules again. But basically, they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword. The reason I like to translate it feed, and it will stand that translation, because what is the sword we use? I hope you know. You would learn of it in Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, whereby it stipulates that our sword is the sword of the Lord, which is his tongue, which is a two-edged sword, which is the truth. It cuts both ways, and it cuts deep. Because when you war with the Lord's sword, you are feeding at the same time. It may not taste good to some, but it does feed. With the sword and the land of Nimrod and the entrances thereof, thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land and when he treadeth within our borders. I hope you're all familiar with the land of Nimrod. It would be the land of the Assyrian along with Babylonia. There you have uh, the types that are being set forth in this end generation do you understand where this country is today? Have you observed? You see it on the news most every day. It's called Iraq, and it's called Kurdistan on both sides of that river. It is called by those names, but the types are still set forth for those that have eyes to see and ears to hear. How you doing, friend? Are you familiar with our Father's word? How would you like to join that army? Verse 7, and the remnant of Jacob, that's all tribes, shall be in the midst of many people as a dew. Now, this would go back to that word waste that I say I like to think of it as feed. As a dew from the Lord, as the showers upon the grass that tarrieth not for men, nor waiteth for the sons of men. The, the tender truth as it flows down like an early morning dew. Some of the, until we had so much acid released into the atmosphere, dew, and probably still is some of the purest water that you can have, distilled by the heavens themselves, that uh, brings that, and it, and it uh, probably what you should think of is the way it falls when you today participate in planting seeds tender, gently, and uh, only with questions being asked does it ever grow forceful or the teaching of the election themselves, the teachings of the remnant themselves, then sometimes the teacher is allowed boldness, all right, directness, but not to the tender blade. Do you understand? Verse 8. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, uh, who, if he go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. That's why I ask you to make a mental note of the thrashing floor described in the 13th verse of the last chapter, the iron horn and the brass hooves. In other words, you know what a young lion would do in a fold of sheep, a flock of sheep. I mean, the rip it in his head. Why? Because a, a lamb is defenseless. The lamb has only one protection. And that's his shepherd. And you are one of those shepherds. Some of you have known since you were a child there was more to God's word than you had been taught. And at the same time, with firmness, keeping the wolves and the lions at bay, 
but at the same time forcefully hurting and taking care of those that belong to the Father and seeing even in the greatest time of opposition in the world, that is to say, when Satan is with us directly, of bringing forth the ministry, you shall minister, and you will minister like a young lion, bringing the sword of the Lord to bear, glistening in the sun of his light, upon the backs of the people of the world at that time when the Assyrian is even at his best. Hey, no step for a stepper, friend. No problem for one of the remnant because with the seven is the eighth and the eighth makes all things possible because he is our rock, he is our foundation, he is our Messiah, he is Yeshua. Verse 9, thine hand shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries, and all thine enemies shall be cut off. Now, this is a wonderful time. Now, this word, this phrase, this terminology, cut off, you're going to see it between now and the 13th verse, thus being, this being the ninth, used five times. Five is what? Grace. But by the grace of God, we have the victory in him. How, how, how many of the enemy would, be able to be, uh, would we be able to cut off all the enemy? That should let you know the hour, verse 10, and the first of the cutoffs, 10. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that I will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee. That's their power, their strength. And I will destroy thy chariots. Do you know why we don't have to worry? Do you trust him? It better. Because even though you're part of the remnant, you're nothing but a little old lamb, and your shepherd does the fighting for you. Your shepherd turns you from a lamb into a lion. You better trust him because he is our strength. He is our power. And again, the term cut off. Verse 11. And I will cut off the cities of the land and throw down all thy strongholds. In other words, there will be no disagreements. No one will be able to argue the case. It is, I mean, the I is emphatic and grace being that five times again another cut off he bobs off the cities verse 12 and i will cut off there it is again witchcrafts out of thine hand and thou shalt have no more soothsayers you're not going to have any more of these fake preachers revolving revs you just won't find them and um Actually, uh, with ministers that really um, are not familiar with the Kenites, that are supposed to teach against them, as it is written, the only two churches that pleased Christ in the great book of Revelation out of the seven being the two that taught who the Kenite were and uh, are in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Verse 13, Thy graven images also will I cut off, and thy standing images out of the midst of thee, and thou shalt no more worship the work of thine hands. Go ahead and build you a little building. Go ahead and put you a big sign on it and call it a house of God and yet never teach God's word there. He says, I'll tear it down. He knows how to put things to good use. Now, I'll tell you something. Many times a Christian will ask me, well, what about witchcraft? Don't sweat it. Don't worry about witchcraft. When it comes to a Christian, there is no such thing. It's a bunch of mumbo jumbo. Throw it out the window. Cast it back against them. All right? It's like when they try to hit you with something, it would be like a slingshot or a boomerang right back into their teeth. Don't worry about it. God has already cut it off for you, all right? 
any of their idol worship or those things that they believe in and seems to put their faith in in traditions and systems, religious systems, forget it. They don't amount to a hill of beans. Now or nor will they ever. Why? You just heard it. God's going to cut it off. Verse 14, And I will pluck up thy groves out of the midst of thee, so will I destroy thy cities. This word cities among the scholars is really, I mean, they, it's up for grabs. And to many think it should be translated enemies. Uh, I quite frankly think it should be idle temples. Your, uh, the places that, you know, when your religious groves, that's where religious worship is supposed to take place. It's the same groves that before Christ's time, they used to roll these fertility eggs, cover, color them, and uh, meet out in the groves, and that was their fertility worship each spring, about the time we have our Passover, rolling those uh, colored eggs. Uh, I don't know how that some Christians put that heathenistic practice back in to themselves, but they, I guess they don't know any better. He says, I'm going to take all that away. And your idle temples whereby you have a system that never quite gets around to explaining or teaching God's word, I'm going to do away with them. Verse 15, and I will execute vengeance in anger and fury upon the heathen such as they have not heard. And anyone, I don't care who, does not have anything to do with race, color, but it does creed. A heathen is somebody that has followed the traditions of men rather than the word of God chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby he has told the prophets all things. And if you understand the prophets, then you understand the events that consummate the chronology, the end times, the consummation of this age. No excuse. Boy, what a chapter. I love it. I really do. If you ever wonder, is Father ever going to stand with us, don't forget this fifth chapter. Five times cut off the enemy. The fact that he is putting together troops, which is to say an army. Do you want to be one? Hey. All you got to do is serve him, but it takes a little qualification. You know, you exercise and practice drill when you belong to a troop so that you have a troop rather than a mob. A troop is well-trained, well-trained. This particular troop, in as much as they are servants of God, are well-trained in his word. I don't know. How you doing? You can probably answer it. Oh, I heard all we had to do was be saved. Well, if, um, if you really don't have much here and don't expect to have much there, well, that's probably true for you. If you want to be one of those, even if you have no more knowledge than that, then maybe you're saved by the spurious Messiah instead of the true, because he's going to come first and grab some out of that field that are supposed to remain working and take them to wife, and they're going to be with child when Christ returns, spiritually speaking, as it is written in Mark 13. Wake up. You live in that generation. Chapter 6, verse 1. Hear ye now what the Lord saith. Arise, contend thou before the mountains, and let the hills hear thy voice. Now, number one, hills do not hear voices. Mountains do not hear voices. These mountains symbolize nations and little countries, or the hills, okay? So that you have it right. And watch the little nations in the world today, especially in the land of Nimrod. Verse 2, hear ye, O mountains. Again, mountains don't have ears. Uh, you get a nice echo occasionally, but uh, it's nations that had better listen. Hear ye, O nations, the Lord's controversy, and ye strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord hath a controversy with his people, and he will plead with Israel. How is he going to plead with Israel? Through you. That's why he wanted the troops. That's how he pleads with them. That's, 
He said, You're, it's, it's going to be like the dew dropping down upon them. The sword's going to be raised upon them. Who, who's going to raise the sword? You. The sword of truth. God's Word. I mean, if you want to have a part in it, if you don't, hey, that's okay. There's some to do. Verse 3. O my people, what have I done unto thee? Question. And wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. Um, tell me how I've injured you, God says. And there are a lot of people that say, well, God, how much time you got? Because you've injured me a bunch. You caused me to lose my farm, my wife. No, uh -uh, don't, don't. Hey, whoa, 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 don't go any further. Don't, don't try to put that trip off on God. You did that to yourself. That's the first thing people want to do is blame God for something when they're the sorriest bunch of sinners, ignorant as far as God's Word is concerned, and want to blame that on God, your own ignorance? A person that is biblically illiterate has no excuse for blaming God because God guarantees blessings if you have knowledge. That's very biblical. If you don't have knowledge, take, don't expect blessings. That's also very biblical and is a true fact. And I'm sure there would be some that say, well, I disagree with that. Well, how are you blessed, son? I'll bet not very good. I would bet even a little more if I were betting. Man, I bet you're not blessed at all. If you're ignorant of God's Word, that means to be biblically illiterate. It just simply means you've never studied God's Word. Because if you are prepared to serve, he's calling in a few volunteers. All, whomsoever will, he's calling in. But you've got to be disciplined. Without discipline, I'm sorry, he can't use you. Bye. Verse 4. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, and I redeemed thee out of the house of servants. You, you were nothing but a bunch of slaves there. And I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. I sent that beautiful girl, Miriam. Uh, I sent uh, Aaron, who would be the father of the Levitical priesthood. And I sent Moses as a type of your Savior that brought you out of there. But it was I that did it. You, you, you want to blame me, God, for that? Part in the Red Sea, feeding you manna from heaven, providing the quail, did I injure you in that? Brought forth the rock that spilled the water for you? Where did I injure you? I say the same thing to you today. Don't try to blame your shortcomings on God. God never injures anyone. People do it to themselves. God will correct. God will chastise. Even the chastisement is brought on by our own shortcomings, and don't you ever try to say different. Verse 5, Oh, my people. You know, God really loves you. Oh, my people. Remember now what Balak, king of Moab, consulted. What, what he tried to rig up. And how Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Chittim, unto Gilgal, that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord. Tell you what, our Father and His saving power and the things that He, the, the, if you've read the history of the things that He has done for our people in the past, you can't doubt that He will guarantee and also do those things that He has covenanted with us for the future. Now, here comes a question from the people. Okay. Question from the people, verse 6. I'm going to help you a little on this, okay, so we stay straight. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord? What should I, how should I serve the Lord, and what should I bring with me? And, and uh, bow myself before the high God. That's to appear to be very humble. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? With calves, this is really your children, sons, of a year old. The question continues from the people. Seven, 
Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Your own children. You know, it actually happened. Second Kings chapter 16, verse 3 would say where they uh, offered to burn their children for Moloch, practice Molochism. And God, it never even came to his mind. He states that in another place. He said, I, I didn't even think about you trying to offer a child for your sins. And he would say in another place, Jeremiah 31, verse 29, about how that a father can sin all he wants to, but it won't set his child's teeth on edge. Why, we all answer for our own sins. So these people are absolutely biblically illiterate, and it shows within the questions that they ask. Verse 8. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do, this is what you want to do, to do justly, simply just be fair, be just, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. That's all he requires. He doesn't want your burnt offerings. He wants your love, and he wants you to have the knowledge of God. You know where that's written. We covered it just a few short weeks ago. Did another special on it. You'll have it soon announced. I'm not going to announce it now. Never forget Hosea. That is salvation. That's what the word means. Chapter 6, verse 6. I'll read it again for you. For This is what God desires. This is what he wants from you. No more, no less. Uh, this is it. For I desired mercy. That's to say love. And not your sacrifice. I mean, sacrifices were symbolic, okay? If you want to sacrifice love to him, that's what you want to sacrifice today. And six continues. And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. In other words, he wants you to acquire the knowledge of God, his wisdom. How do I do that? From his word, of course. How can you... How can you distill or bring down the Word of God, be useful to Him if you don't know the Word of God, if you're ignorant of it? There's no way that you can plan. Well, well when did He decide He didn't want the burnt offerings? When Christ became the sin offering for one and all times. And it's blasphemy to suggest an offering of any other kind as far as burnt offerings are concerned. Certainly an animal could never replace the beautiful uh, son, the only begotten, Jesus, the Messiah. That's all he wants from you is just simply be fair and love him. Isn't that kind of what any father expects from his children? Hmm? I mean... Do you, want, do you mean to tell you, I think I'll just spend just another moment and take this a step further. This idiot that's asking this question, it would just be like somebody saying to you, do you want me to murder one of your grandchildren and bring them to you for an offering for my sins? How would you feel if one of your idiots murdered one of your grandchildren and brought it to you for their sins? Well, do you think you have more compassion than God does? I would hope not. I just want you to see how ridiculous it is. He simply wants you to love him and humbly serve him. Verse 9, the Lord's voice crieth unto the city, and the man of wisdom, that's the one that has a little stability to him, shall see thy name, hear ye the rod, and who hath appointed it? I mean, if somebody's got a little stability, they recognize the rod when it comes their way. They also know who appointed it. That's the rod of chastisement, if you don't understand what I'm saying. Verse 10. 
are there yet the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked? And the scant measure that is abomin abominable? That is to say, you know what word scant means? It means it ain't quite enough. It's supposed to be a pound weight, and it's only three quarters of a pound, so they rip you off when you want to sell a pound of your grain. They only pay you for three quarters of a pound. A right? bunch of crooks. Okay, you got it? God calls that an abomination. You want a whole bushel and you get three pecks. Verse 11. Shall I count them pure with the wicked balances and with the bag of deceitful weights? If you, if you don't understand the law concerning this, make a note of Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 13. God doesn't like it. He doesn't like rip-off artists. That's not just. That's not right being righteous, that's crooked as a dog's hind leg. Yes, but I have to stay in business. I'm going to tell you what kind of business you're in if you have to stay in business by using crooked weights. You're in the business of going straight to hell. Have a good trip, won't you? Enjoy your stay. Verse 12. For the rich men thereof are full of violence, and the inhabitants thereof have broken, have spoken lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Well, I, boy, I could do a lot better of bringing that up to modern day language. It says here, those rich men that do this, that practice this abomination, that practice this uh, lie, that not only are their weights unbalanced, but their tongue and their mouth is as crooked as well. It's as unbalanced as well. They don't care what they say or how they have to say it. Verse 13. Therefore also will I make thee sick in smiting thee. <laughs> He's going to make it hurt. In making thee desolate because of thy sins. Um, I will be striking you and to the amount of your sins. That's why you want to be real careful, friend. 14. Thou shalt eat, but not be satisfied. And thy casting down shall be in the midst of thee. And, shalt, and thou shalt take hold, but shalt not deliver. And that which thou deliverest will I give up to the sword. You may store it up, but you're not going to save it. That's what he's saying. You may eat, but you're not going to be satisfied. And with some of the manufacturing of food we have in this generation, I'll use the white bread that I used it uh, not long ago, where you take the heart out of the wheat and the brand around it so we can feed our cattle and make them nice and chunky. And we leave you the white paste that goes around it that has no food value whatsoever. I mean, you can take a piece of white bread that you buy in a loaf and pull it up in a ball and bounce it. You know, you can play ball with it. You can eat all of it you want to, but you're not going to do a day's work because there's no food value in it, basically. Well, it says on the envelope it has a, this many vitamins and that many. Well, hey, you get a little fallout anywhere, don't you? You can buy wheat bread. Don't get ripped off, you know. 15. Thou shalt sow, but thou shalt not reap. Thou shalt tread the olives, but thou shalt not anoint thee with oil. And sweet wine, but shall not drink wine. You know why? You can put it all down, but you're not going to be around long enough for that wine juice to ferment into real wine. I mean, he's telling you here, you're on short time in a religious sense. You're about to get there, friend. For the stat verse 16, I think we'll go ahead and finish this chapter with verse 16 and we'll stop for this lecture. For the statutes of Omri, that is to say, uh, Kukut, which is a religious statutes, okay, um, uh, are kept in all the works of the house of Ahab. You know who Ahab was married to? 
and ye walk in their counsels, that I should make thee a desolation in the inhabitants thereof, and hissing. Therefore ye shall bear the reproach of my people. The traditions of pagans. Oh dear God, thank goodness we don't have any traditions of paganism around anymore. Don't make me laugh. Please don't make me laugh. There are so many traditions of paganism that have worked their way into Christianity and the people think it's, um, well, Grandpa did it. That doesn't make it right. If it isn't biblical, it isn't biblical. <clears throat> and your grandpa might have been a wonderful person, but if he was sucked in, then you're sucked in just like he was. I'll just roll back to the fertility rites of rolling and painting them little legs out in the groves of fertility, you know, and paint little bunny rabbits to get in the mood there, quick like a rabbit, okay? Right in the Christian church, friend. Now, I know I just say these things to win friends and influence people. Well, not really. I'm not looking for a popularity contest to win, but to teach word and let the truth distill as dew on those tender blades that would hear the truth and recognize where shortcomings will end you. And they will be the end of you. Cut down, cut down, cut down. Don't get under the ax. He has plainly and simply told you the things that he abhors. He likes for you to gain knowledge from his word, not the words of men, not this man or any other man. Always check them out in the word of God and make sure it squares. Don't, don't uh, study under one of these carpenter's sons that tells you always make it just a little better than flush. Now, uh, I hope you understand what a little better than flush is. You see, there's no such thing as a little better than flush. If it's flush, it's flush. What a generation. I just thought the only thing they think of when you use the word flush you're not going to know what a little better than flush is. Oh, well, I give up, but I won't quit. God bless you. You listen a moment, won't you please?